Hello to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. A very warm welcome to all of you in the room and to all the other participants online. I know there are many of them. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the session entitled Addressing uh, Health and Migration as a Global Priority in a Changing World. The session has been uh, co-designed by the MH Alliance and uh, the uh, WHO program uh, on migration and health. And I want to thank very much uh, the director of this program, Dr. Santino Severoni, who will be co-chair the session with me and uh, his wonderful team, Arthur and uh, Rita Samachado, for the wonderful work for this, uh, for this session. In a few words, the MAT Alliance, you know it, uh, is the backbone of this uh, summit. Uh, it's actually an alliance of academic uh, health centers, universities, and national acad academies. And at the moment has uh, 30 members in 20 countries. And also includes uh, the Inter-Academy Partnership, which uh, represents the national academies of medicine and science in 130 uh, countries. So uh, the topic of uh, migration and health is very important for the summit. We organize several sessions in the summit uh, in Berlin and also in the regional summits in different continents. And especially I felt as Italian, this topic very important after 2015. As you know, there was a huge crisis in Europe with uh, more than 1 million immigrants coming to Germany, a very high number of immigrants also to other countries such as Sweden, for instance, which was very generous at that time, hosting about 180,000 people and of course also my country, Italy, which was uh, of course uh, um, under the, <coughs> and the situation of uh, having a number of immigrants that we have to say was never very high compared to our population, but in terms of impact, of course, on the country was also very difficult. So I felt <coughs> it was very important, uh, again, as a member of the MAT Alliance and now also member of the Executive uh, Committee of the MAT Alliance to take this topic as a main topic uh, also from my university, Sapienza University of Rome in Italy, where uh, I am a vice rector. But uh, without uh, uh, further ado, since we have a really very distinguished and expert panelists in this, uh, in this session that will be divided in two, we have a first uh, lineup of uh, speakers now and then a second one in a, in a few, few minutes. I would like to leave the floor immediately to Dr. Santino Severoni, who unfortunately could not join us in person here in Berlin, but is online. So thank you, Santino, for everything. I'll leave you the floor for an introduction. Thank you, thank you, Luciano. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome to we the- We don't hear you, Santino. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Luciano, for your nice introduction. It's really indeed a pleasure to team up again with you and with the M M8 uh, on um, activities related to health and migration. We really look also to continue this collaboration further. Uh, I want to take this opportunity indeed to apologize for not being able to be with you to the, uh, today there in Berlin. Uh, I'm on my way to the airport for a mission, so this was the only way to, uh, to join you. And um, I would like to start by thanking and welcoming an impressive list of speakers. Uh, today we have representatives from the political world, uh, policy environment, uh, academic environment, international organizations, and civil society. So a really mixed um, group of uh, uh, experience and expertise, which we want to listen to. We thought to organize this um, session around two topics. Uh, particularly because we wanted to uh, try to see what functioning and what not, and what is the mechanic in uh, really placing the health and migration as a priority at country level and internationally, but also to, to see how things are changing or how we can promote changes. So the focus will be on policy, the first part, and research, which is an essential component to support policy, but I would say any kind of uh, informed uh, scientific uh, decision, particularly in this area. Uh, just a couple of points of introduction to stimulate reflection and discussion later on. Um, when we talk about health and migration, and migration in general, uh, we all know that we are talking about a very political sensitive issue, often polarizing, but still on top of the agenda of the political agenda of all countries. And uh, we tend to uh, rightly, in many cases, to focus on the challenges, on the problems, 
but uh, this also um, need to be done in my view with a bit of uh, care not to uh, develop only a narrative a negative narrative around this issue this is a fact of life and uh, things are changing things are moving uh, since uh, the uh, recent past and um, allow me to uh, start this session with a note of uh, optimism which I'm, in my view is needed for this world um, when we look at the situation a few years ago, uh, probably in the health sector, there was not even the knowledge that health sector has to play a very important role in managing the, uh, not only the health aspect of migration, but I would say the migration phenomenon as a whole. Well. Uh, the experience of um, COVID, uh, despite was dramatic in many extent, uh, for the issue of health and migration resulted to be also a booster, not only uh, making to emerge still in inequalities or gaps, but a booster for change. For the first time, many countries adopted a proper public health approach, an inclusive public health approach. Many countries didn't fear to promote a universalistic approach of the health system, including refugees and migrants, regardless of their own legal status, into access of preventive and curative service. So, uh, if we look at the policy landscape, also it's quite interesting, I would say promising as well. A few years ago, there was a bit of blaring picture, not, not real clarity how to position the health sector, what role should, should we should have as health sector. Let's imagine that MDGs, they were not really uh, spelling out properly the issue of migration. Uh, nowadays, the situation is totally changed. Probably Never like now, we are having a very solid policy framework ready to guide us, ready to inspire us, our action globally, regionally, or uh, nationally, or sub-nationally. Uh, for the first time, we have a very clear um, goal to reach with the SDGs, also supported by clear indicators. 34 indicators are developed to really document progresses in relation of uh, managing or addressing the issues around migration, including, including health. Uh, but also, uh, we have a global compact on migration, a global compact on refugees. For the first time, member states all around the world, they engage into a very active intergovernmental negotiation to define principles and way forward to manage migration and to really have a better functioning support response to the needs represented by uh, by refugees um, also uh, as a who we try to do our part we felt that there was a gap in uh, who role we're supposed to be more active we're supposed to place who in a more uh, strategic position in relation to the health aspect that migration might pose or challenges or needs and uh, uh, a global compact a, a global action plan sorry was uh, developed and adopted in 2019 we are approaching next year where discussion for extension will take place and this is supported by two important resolutions the 61 17, spelling out how health system is supposed to be more effective for this group of population, and the resolution 7015, which is really indicating a step forward. Uh, but um, reducing or focusing our, um, fo our, our sight on country reality, I'm very pleased to see a changing world. Today, topic is a global priority in a changing world, and I can tell it is not an optimistic statement, but is a matter of fact that the world is changing. Uh, just recently in May took place in New York, the uh, International Migration Review Forum, basically stock taking of progress in the implementation of the global compact since its adoption. And um, it's amazing to see how the atmosphere, the overall atmosphere of member states changed from skepticism and fear of the time in 2018 of the adoption, uh, fear for uh, maybe international instrument taking over the sovereignty, decision making and responsibility of member states. No, the contrary, we have seen countries extremely uh, dynamically engaging and uh, this is confirmed by the more than 150 pledges presented by member states in, uh, in New York. And the same is uh, for the health sector. Um, we see more and more uh, countries uh, engaging into the health domain of health and migration. We have record of Ministry of Health 
also establishing focal points, capacity into Ministry of Health. And this is a very important process. And my um, request for discussion and for the future, how we can continue to support these changes and how we can build up on uh, those uh, those progress. I'm stopping here for the interest, interest of time because we have a long list of speakers and I don't want to take their own time and space. So thank you very much, Luciano. Welcome again to all uh, participants. Thank you very much, uh, Santino, for this very interesting introduction. Please uh, feel free to join us at any time as a co-chair of, of the session. So now we start, as uh, we said, the first part of this session entitled Ensuring a Coherent Policy Response to Advance the Immigration Health Agenda. And I have uh, the pleasure to invite the first speaker, His Excellency, Excellency uh, Mladen Ivanovic who is a member of a former member of the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he will give a talk on experiences from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the need for the intergovernmental uh, cooperation to provide transit migrants with healthcare. Thank you. If you Thank you very much. To, maybe to move here, just for the people okay. in the back, I think it will be easier to okay. see you. Thank you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's not so easy to be the politician among the experts in this area, but I suppose that I will survive, uh, especially after surviving political circumstances in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think this panel will be not so difficult. Uh, just about the two, two things. First, where Bosnia was when it's about the healthcare generally. Maybe the best example is situation with the COVID. If you see the data, even today's data, Bosnia is on the third place globally. If you compare the number of the deaths with the per 1 million people. So that means that Bosnian healthcare is really not with high quality. But second data is even more important. If you see where is the Bosnia comparing the whole number, total number, of the infected people with the COVID, Bosnia is on 111 place. Not because there were not so much COVID there, but the testing was not done because of the lack of the money and the lack of uh, even interest. And uh, from the organizational point of view, the healthcare system was not so efficient. So this is first example where the healthcare system of Bosnia was. After that, we were faced with another challenge which we never had before. This is migration. In Bosnia, uh, basically this problem started five years ago, just two years before the COVID. And the total number of the migrants who went through Bosnia and who was registered was about the 80, little bit less than 100,000 people. In reality, we believe that it's at least two, maybe even three times bigger because the people were not registered. Why? The government was not interested to register them because if you register them, you have to secure them facilities, you have to have to, to give them space to live, you have to think about them, you have to take even the health care of them. So what was the approach of the government just to help them to move and to go further. So the whole story was everything was organized in a way that even the buses were there to collect them and to send them to the border with the Croatia, just hoping that they will leave. That was basically at the beginning, especially the approach of the of the government. Another example is the fact that we had, let's say, a minister of the human rights, so a little bit responsible also for the migrants. But you know who was in charge of the whole migrant story in Bosnia? Minister of Security. Because there were so many prejudices by the people, especially by the ordinary people at that time, in Bosnia, which is by itself a very complicated society, which had a war and which had a lot of let's say ethnical problems, but also a little bit religious, religious problems. Bosnia is a very mixed society. So the, the majority of the migrants 
came from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Iran, at the beginning from Syria later, not so much from Syria and Afghanistan. Basically, these were the main, uh, let's say, origin countries of, of the migrants. So non-Muslim part of the, of the Bosnian population had a fear of that. Even the Bosnian Muslim part of uh, uh, a lot of Muslims didn't want to really have a fear of the, let's say, different Muslims. And so th that was very, very politically sensitive uh, uh, issue, which had influence on the real life of the migrants on the ground. At the beginning, as I said, there was nobody was interested to deal with that. And I have to say that the only part which had in which deserves a lot of support are the local people in the local communities. They did tremendous job on, on the ground based or on their enthusiastic approach, not because of the organization, not because of the legal framework. Simply these people couldn't see these people of the, the migrants without doing something they had to do something and they did a huge job so the only part of the government which really deserves some sort of the support are the local state level entity level because we have two entities two let's say provinces they didn't do anything they just tried to ignore this this issue at the beginning we didn't have even camps where these people <clears throat> could stay there was somewhere there in the empty facilities without having any sort of the of the healthcare especially especially at the beginning almost nothing later thanks to i have to say two players one is international organizations like uh, red cross iom uh, unhcr uh, who they made the pressure on 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 a little bit on the political elite but mainly on media because without that pressure, the politicians wouldn't do anything special. Another significant and very important players were the NGOs, Doctors Without the Borders. In the case of Bosnia, I think Danish Refugee Council was very much involved in that. And they made the pressure and slowly, slowly even the higher level government started to deal with these issues. So we now have, let's say, Three relatively well organized, relatively well organized camps for the for the migrants where, where they can stay. It's again northwest part of Bosnia, close to the Croatian border, and there are some facilities also around the Sarajevo. <clears throat> Still, some parts didn't want to see migrants in their part of Bosnia. There was almost a conflict, as I remember, when there was an attempt to send a group of uh, migrants from Sarajevo to Mostar, Sarajevo mainly, uh, uh, let's say, Muslim populated part of Bosnia, Mostar mainly Croat populated part, and there was almost a conflict between the two police. One police wanted to stop them, another one to, to escort them. It was very close to have a real, real, real fight. The situation is now a little bit better, but again, thanks to this pressure which came from the uh, international, different international institutions. Recently, I think we have a relatively good healthcare system, especially speaking about the primary healthcare, secondary and even higher level, still nothing, honestly, very still nothing. If you see the number of the, uh, I, I think uh, only those who are in the camps basically have that, the others, no way. So it's left left to them. Okay, because of the Ukrainian war, the current situation is not so difficult. We have estimation is that now in Bosnia there are just two, three thousand uh, migrants still waiting and trying to to go there. From the legal point of view, Bosnia had just one uh, part, let's say, legally relatively well prepared. This was asylum seekers' rights. That was done in a way that everything was within the law. But honestly, <laughs> we didn't have experience with the asylum seekers because 
you know, to try to, to ask asylum for, in Bosnia, which was a symbol of the war. So not too many people were interested to do it that. So we didn't have the real experience even with that. Thanks, as I said, to the support of the international institutions, thanks to the NGOs who involved that, we have now much better situation. And still, it's thanks to the media pressure, thanks to the fact that EU also took responsibility in putting us the conditions. If we want to go much closer, to be much closer with the EU, we had to do something with that. So these are the main players. Locally, people still not. So we just recently had elections. In spite of the so high level, third place globally, number of the deaths per million, people re-elected all these people again. So in, in our case, health was not so significant. So these people were re-elected also. Everything happened just two years ago. It shows that from time to time, if you want to do something with the politicians, you have to find a different way and not just to wait on the normal pressure from the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting intervention. So we will have questions at the end of this part of the session. So I also encourage uh, our colleagues online to put uh, uh, online some of the questions. We will try to have a discussion that will not be too long, unfortunately, because the time is limited, but we will try our best. So now it's a pleasure to give the floor to Petra Kuri. She is the Director of Global Health and Care of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And she will talk about a coherent policy response to advance the migration health agenda. What now? Thank you, good morning. Uh, addressing uh, the needs of people on the move is uh, at the core at, of what the Red Cross Red Crescent does in the world. Just a few figures. In 2021, the Red Cross Red Crescent societies have reached around 9 million people on the move, whether they're refugees, migrants, or internally displaced. And um, Your Excellency, your example of how the Red Cross at the border is just one of those examples of how the uh, Red Cross Red Crescent uh, response. Some prominent examples of uh, what they've done in the last year when, when it comes to COVID, the, uh, the, the Red Cross Red Crescent have reached to areas uh, and people of displaced and migrants that 15 years, no one has even done any type of vaccination. And an example would be the Pakistani Red Crescent. Uh, they they reached uh, people uh, that had in the past 15 years not been vaccinated in any sort of routine Im immunization. Another example would be the Bangladesh Red Crescent, where they were uh, they vaccinated 10 million uh, uh, displaced. And um, and then lately on the Ukraine crisis, just to give figures, we have 32 Red Cross Red Crescents responding to the Ukraine um, refugee crisis. Uh, and overall, our uh, we have 110 Red Cross Red Crescent responding to the migration refugees crisis. When it comes uh, to policy making and what needs to be done and how can we have a coherent uh, response and drawing along a, a of what the figures that the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, have done and their experience in the field, our uh, recommendations and what we saw over the years stems in three main um, areas. One is about what governments uh, need to uh, have. The second one is around what local communities need to develop. And the third one is about interagencies and what agencies that work in the field of refugees, migrants can do to improve the health services of migrants and refugees. When it comes to governments, and Your Excellency, thank you for sharing um, your experience on this. Obviously, governments, when they develop their health response plans, the migrant refugees are not part of that national response plans in many, any, many 
um, countries and specifically because of the political um, issues, internal political uh, issues that they have. So it is important when they're developing their national health response plans that they have a component that looks at refugees, migrants, and displaced within that health uh, response plan. And, and specifically when it comes to access to health services, when it comes to health information, health information and data sharing is key because of the cross-border that happens. We see it in many um, places, not just in, uh, in when it comes to this place, but also we see it with the Red Cross in different countries uh, for the nomads population and others where we would need to have that health information sharing to continue the con for the continuity of uh, health services. So for us, health information infrastructure systems are key for longer and sustainable health services for the migrants and displaced wherever they go, wherever they end up uh, staying. The other component that governments can build on um, is the element of trust between the governments and the local responders, the local actors, because migrants displaced have fears uh, against governments. They end up not going and showing up for health services. And that's where the local actors, whether it is Red Cross, Red Crescent, or other agencies working at, as uh, community actors, governments need to um, build off that trust element between the migrants displaced and uh, the local actors. For the, um, uh, the health community actors, which is Red Cross and others that work in the community, one of the things that we noticed is that health information reached migrants and displaced in a language they don't understand. So language barrier is a key element. And um, and we see it because usually what happens is that agencies, governments use their own language to send health information, which is and mostly for the migrants displaced is not the language they understand their health. And it, and it is important that we reach to them through the right language. The second one is the communication channels. Uh, we see sometimes a smart phones or smart devices being used as a channel, many of the displaced migrants do not have access to these facilities, to these technologies. And so using the right communication channel is uh, needed when we reach out to, to them. The last uh, uh, part is the interagency and intergovernmental coordination. There is definitely a need that we come up with a coordinated approach across the agencies that work uh, for the health of migrants displaced and refugees. It strengthens our response, all of us as a collection to respond to their needs. But also in this coordinated plan, it is important we put them at the center and we give them a seat at the table with us. We, it is important that we hear from them so that we can actually respond to their needs when it comes to health services. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, in this part of the session, we have a Poonam Davan, a Senior Migration Health Policy Advisor of IOM, and uh, she will talk about operationalizing migration health policy at country level, the case of the GCM and SDGs. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you also to the chair joining us virtually and everyone who's here. Um, going last in uh, in this session, I have to first say that I completely agree with all the good points that have already been made in the context of coherent policy approaches for migration health. Uh, my task will be to uh, illustrate uh, how we can actually then operationalize some of these strategic policy opportunities two of which were already mentioned in the introduction, um, one being the Global Compact for Migration or the GCM in short, which does feature health as a cross-cutting priority. References to health and healthcare access uh, were included by governments in many objectives, and they do provide a tremendous opportunity to promote the health of migrants. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, and as Santino mentioned, through the first International Migration Review Forum this May in very in this year, member states committed to integrate public health into uh, various pledges that have been made to advance migration policy development and implementation, including through national and local healthcare policies. So with the GCM on the one hand as a key migration policy agenda, we then also have the overall development agenda or the SDGs. When we think of migration health, um, it's important to bear in mind not only SDG 3 um, on health, but also look at SDG 10, which talks about reducing inequalities uh, within and across countries. But then also in uh, given the importance of addressing health in an intersectoral manner, especially when it comes to the health of migrants, there is also the lens across other SDGs, whether it's SDG 5 on gender equality, SDG 8 on decent work, when we think of the health of migrant workers, SDG 13 on climate action with more and more interrelations with disasters and displacement, etc. So operationalizing migration health policy at country level based on IOM's own experience uh, from many, many decades of work requires innovative evidence-based policies, but also sustainable financial mechanisms that can allow for whole of society and whole of government actions but also involve migrants and displaced communities themselves, because they also have agency and can be co-developers and providers of health services. So I'd like to share four strategic approaches here today in terms of this operational approach. Number one being establishing and implementing such migrant inclusive health policies with a clear focus on expanding coverage that can ensure equitable access to healthcare, but can also systematically integrate them for social protection and financial risk protection. This can be done, for instance, through multi-sectoral community-based programs, um, such as, for example, those organized by IOM together with the government and other partners in Brazil for supporting Venezuelan migrants in the north by expanding access to primary health care, but also vaccination services through the pandemic. Another approach can be ensuring access to knowledge and sharing of solutions. Petra made reference to this need of cross-border data sharing. There is also a need to generate more pertinent and current evidence that can be done through the mapping of migration profiles, but also their health status in country, such as was done recently in Vietnam together with WHO and IOM, whereby migrant health mapping across different parts of the country has resulted in real evidence that can then be used to formulate a national migration health plan. The third approach also already referred to on fostering multi-stakeholder participation. And here one key lesson we have learned from experience is the need to not only look uh, within countries, but always look across borders and also look at countries along migration pathways. So for instance, in Northern Africa, where a lot of work is now being focused by IOM, but also governments and partners on looking at migrant transit routes and migration pathways across various countries, because there is this huge unmet need to address continuity of care and continuity of service provision. And then lastly, building resilience of local health systems. Uh, even here at the World Health Summit, we are hearing a lot being discussed around pandemic preparedness. So when we talk about any future mechanisms or new policy frameworks for addressing pandemic preparedness, resilience, and response, we cannot uh, 
afford to ignore the role of human mobility and the need to ensure well-managed human mobility in any such future uh, pandemic preparedness and response. And this is where, again, those of us who work on health need to go out of our comfort zones and work with border officials, work with immigration authorities, foreign affairs, and ministries of interior, for example, bringing that knowledge of disease threats and the links with mobility to those other sectors. So I'll, I'll conclude here simply by noting that while uh, much work still remains to be done, through some of these uh, intergovernmental and international mechanisms, good steps have been taken in the right direction. And uh, we are grateful to the World Health Summit, the M8 Alliance and other partners so that we can continue to bring such engagement forward. Thank you. So thank you very much to the first three panelists for the very interesting interventions, also for keeping the time. Now we have a few minutes for discussion. I ask if there are questions from the room or questions online. I also encourage the participants online to put the question there. But let me start maybe with Santino, if you have any uh, immediate comments uh, since you are uh, there with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Yes, indeed, uh, exciting uh, panel. Uh, striking sharing uh, and presentation from Excellency uh, Ivanich, which is I, which highlighted the importance of the political commitment and sometimes the political disengagement and uh, limited access to services utilized as a uh, deterrent for uh, stop uh, or, or, or managing the migration migration phenomenon. But in that uh, contribution, I see a lot of interesting points. Uh, the points of uh, really we need to probably join forces, at least particularly countries, in promoting a shared responsibility and inter-country cooperation approach. We have seen this happening with Ukraine, with Syria and in Turkey, but this is supposed to be a sort of standard operating procedure where the international community is ready to support countries which confront with shortage of capacity, uh, resources, human and, uh, and financial. I was very uh, excited to see the role of the advocacy uh, part uh, implemented by international community. I think this is very important, particularly uh, now that we have a solid policy frameworks vision and evidence to uh, to support this advocacy advocacy role i really like also the uh, sharing of um, the colleague from red cross uh, petra because this is really uh, a reality check uh, what is functioning what need to be uh, improved uh, indeed the um, element of uh, preparedness and response uh, it's uh, painful to admit that despite we are talking about preparedness and uh, responsiveness and readiness uh, in reality we see very seldom uh, preparedness plan or contingency plan at country level including also the management on large influx of uh, refugees and migrants and the issue of data and uh, uh, health information system we're going to have a session on research so i'm not going to comment but this is also very very important in conclusion, Poonam, I like that you offer very precise entry points. Uh, migration is a multi-topic issue, is a whole government approach. We need to keep working with that. I really love your statement saying the uh, health sector needs to go out of the comfort zone because um, we do know very well what to do in the health sector, but uh, decisions are taken out of the health sector. Um, the decision out of the health sector, they're having tremendous implication for the health sector and health outcome of this population. So indeed, this is the passport to, to uh, see changes and to see uh, progresses. I'm stopping here, uh, Luciano. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Santino. I ask if there are questions in the room. If you do, please also state your name and institution when you ask a question. I see one here, please. There are microphones in the room. so. I see many hands. I mean, I just, we will have just a few minutes. Unfortunately, overall is 90 minutes for this session. So I can probably take two or three, but please go ahead, short. 
uh, question, please also uh, tell uh, to whom uh, the, the, the question is addressed and very short answer, please. Okay, my name is Liza Dunn. Hi, Petra, how are you? I'm from Bayer and I'm very interested in migration. And I was wondering if you have a, an example of a successful model of how a maybe that would that could be a template to be used for reaching uh, hard to reach populations. <laughs> like Petra, you want to go ahead? Yes. I don't know if it's working. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we do. I actually gave the example at the Pakistani, at the um, Balochistan border with Afghanistan, where the, the population there has not been reached with any routine immunization for 15 years. No one has visited them. And so there's a lot of examples at the Red Cross that we can draw on of how they were able to reach them and sustain it. It's not just a one-time visit and you walk away. It's actually going there and becoming the de facto for these uh, people to come to you for their health services through these mobile health teams that we sent. I mean, the issue of access is real. These people live in areas usually that there is no inf health infrastructure. And so how do we get the health infrastructure to them is also important in addition to the trust for them to coming forth. Sure. Thank you. There is another question over there. I see too many hands. Unfortunately, I apologize in advance. It will be impossible. But let's go ahead with another couple of them, and then we will need to move to the next part. Uh, hi, um, I'm Jordan Klein of uh, Princeton University. Um, and I also had a question for Dr. Curry. Uh, you hadn't mentioned the need for different types of uh, data to really be able to um, monitor migration in real time. Um, it'd be great if you could talk more about some of, you know, what you think these types of data are and the way that we might be able to leverage them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that the challenges we see across border, uh, but the Red Cross, Red Crescent Society suffer from is this data sharing and the continuity of care. And some of these uh, kids, they get those one in one place and then they miss on those two, those three. So, while I understand the privacy confidentiality of and the need to protect health information, we need to come up with an architecture that goes uh, in a, has a little bit of identifiers, basic identifiers, simple um, HIS systems. So we have an, ex an, an example experience in Lebanon in one of the refugee camps with the Syrian refugees where there was a, they created a, a simple HIS portfolio for the refugees, uh, which has some data elements and they can carry it with them anywhere they go, uh, either a flash drive or something simple where they can take with them that but it is important we look at that health infrastructure it's a big challenge and the and the nomads which we all know is is another place where we suffer uh, and we create this cross border uh, sharing but it's not uh, legalized or it's not yet adopted by governments thank you the last question over there i see sorry i apologize for the other people but maybe we will have a few more minutes at the end we will see Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Karl Puchner and I'm from Paul Secures Research. My question goes to the representative for IOM. Um, you have mentioned that it's important to think in terms of uh, routes and pathways and ensure a continuity of care or try to ensure continuity of care. Could you elaborate on perhaps existing examples uh, of uh, such projects? Because I can imagine that it's hard to get states coordinating this sort of interventions given all to the different uh, policy approaches or migration governance they might have so i guess this is that this is something that uh, could be implemented more easily by an international agency or ngo could you please elaborate a bit more on that Uh, looking at the time and also happy to speak offline after the event or share further, but uh, one concrete example would indeed be an ongoing regional program in, in North Africa involving countries such as Morocco, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, uh, where 
the international organizations, including IOM and WHO, of course, are playing a coordinating role, a technical support role, but it has actually been possible to bring together ministries of health, but ministries of immigration and uh, local uh, officials as well. So whereas there is a component within the program to provide direct health assistance or services to certain groups of vulnerable uh, migrants, there's also a strong component of capacity development. Uh, just recently, just earlier this week, actually, um, a symposium was organized with uh, different ministries from about five countries also looking at the increasing impact of climate change in Northern Africa and how that's becoming a driver and impacting migration. So that would be one example. And another example would be um, also we have global health donors, including the Global Fund and Gavi, increasingly recognizing the importance of migration and displacement. Uh, when we speak of achieving health goals or SDG targets, even for specific diseases like TB, HIV, and malaria. So a very um, interesting program, again, in the Middle East, looking at uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, but also now involving Iraq and some other countries in the region, whereby not only can there be direct health service provision, but also an inter intergovernmental or cross-border component looking at displaced populations, in this case, Syrians. So happy to share more examples. And, and we do hope that more and more agencies and um, sectors will be able to take on uh, cross-border and regional approaches. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize again. Uh, there were other questions also online that we don't have time to address now. Please join me in thanking uh, again uh, the panelists for this part of this session. Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask uh, Professor Stephen Martlin, who is a visiting professor at the Institute of uh, Innovation of uh, Global Health at the Imperial College L London, to share some reflections in order to move also in a smooth way to the next part of the session, which will be dedicated to research. Thank you, Luciano. Could I have my slide set up, please? So um, I've been asked to accompany a bit of a mass migration that's going to take place now to the uh, speaker's table with a, a brief reflection uh, on the policy panel that we've just been listening to and look towards the, the next panel that's coming. And with regard to policy to address health and migration, uh, does that take me to the next slide? Somebody? Take care of the transition, please. It doesn't work. Okay. No, it's working. Oh, okay. No, it's working right. Okay. Um, we know quite a lot about the oops about the question of what's the problem that we're trying to address. Uh, we know that uh, in recent times we've seen new milestones being reached in the number of migrants globally and in the number of people who have been forced to flee. And we know that many of these people who move face poorer health and are more vulnerable than those in their host populations. The question why this is the case turns out, though, to be very complex to answer. And indeed, as we heard in the discussions this morning, there are actually many answers, many different answers with different sources. And this is because there are many different challenges that interact in the, uh, the things that make up migrant and refugee health, creating a nexus of great complexity with multiple causes. And many of these challenges are global in character, that is, they stretch from global to local in nature. And many of these challenges uh, um, consequently uh, appear in the policy responses that are needed, which are also often very complex and requiring coherence uh, across the global spaces. So we've heard references this morning to what happens at country level in places like uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Pakistan, and other countries. Uh, and at the same time, we've heard about the importance of uh, global frameworks uh, 
uh, ranging from principles such as those in the uh, uh, human rights charters and in uh, compacts and agreements on migration and on refugees um, to uh, very specific things like the targets in the SDGs. Uh, getting coherence between those things that are signed up to globally and what happens at national level is often one of the great difficulties. And at the same time, as we've also heard, the cross-sectorality of the problems that impact on and, uh, and, and our provinces for different decision makers to act in, um, uh, the, the health of migrants and refugees means that uh, even within a country, there are many different challenges to coherence. So this complexity of factors that affects migrant and refugee health is reflected in the very diverse models that have been developed uh, to describe them. And uh, one very important model that's often applied to consider aspects of migrant and refugee health is the, oops, sorry, I need to go back there, is the uh, model of social determinants of health, uh, which can be applied to the conditions of, of migrants. And uh, when the term social is used here, it's generally understood to mean actually a combination of social, political, economic, and environmental factors. And uh, in each specific aspect of this model, uh, there are pointers to opportunities for policy interventions. But what is extremely important to remember, of course, is that all of these different, if you like, cells in this uh, in this uh, structure are interconnected and interactive. And it would be foolish to imagine that you can make a policy intervention directed just at one of those without considering all the other contexts. Otherwise, you're very likely to get um, uh, answers and, and results that are, uh, to, to say the least, unexpected. Now, uh, migration itself is also a determinant of health, and we've heard references this morning to some of the ways in which the journey of the migrant, beginning before they leave their normal original place of residence, going on through the journey, and on into the the intermediates, the transitions, and the, the, the eventual terminus, all of these impact on the present and potential future health of the migrant. And uh, very different kinds of health conditions and health needs can arise at different points along this journey and need particular policies, actions, mechanisms uh, in order to deal with what are really, again, examples of local challenges. And um, as was referred to in the discussions uh, uh, in, in the last session, uh, the, the question of the portability of data is one of these global factors that still remains actually both a policy and a technical challenge. And that data is of at least two kinds, as we re heard referred to. One is data about the migrants to better understand them and what their needs are. But the other is from the point of view of individual migrants, uh, their own health history, the history of what, what their problems are and what the treatments have been so far should be an integral part of their present and future health treatment. And that's very often not been accessible to them uh, for various reasons, lost or, or simply blocked um, and fragmented. And this is an area where we still need a combination of better policies and appropriate technologies to make those policies work. So um, in, in some of the areas that we've worked on in the last year, uh, we have uh, emphasized a multi-factor approach to trying to deal with all of these uh, issues, which includes these health determinants, both the social and migration type, also the uh, structural factors such as rights and governance, policy and practice, and the human security framework, which very importantly emphasizes the, uh, sorry, the, uh, questions of freedom from fear and want, which make up so much of whether uh, an individual migrant is able to approach people for the right kinds of help. So moving on now to where we are now and research, uh, Luciana, I'm coming to my last slide when I can get it to, oops, when I can get this to go the right way. I don't know why I'm having so much difficulty with it. Um, the question is, what don't we know? And the answer is we still don't know an awful lot, including about the conditions that affect the health of migrants and refugees, what the causes and the impacts of those conditions are, and what the solutions are. And we also don't know that much yet about uh, 
how to research migrant and refugee health and which issues to prioritize. So I'll hand back now to Luciano to go into the research section. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, by the way, the publications uh, which were cited uh, in these slides are available online uh, in open access on the M8 Alliance webpage. And this is the actually uh, the outcome of many meetings organized by the M8 Alliance. So some of them in person before COVID, uh, we did three uh, expert meetings in Rome. And then after that, there were many webinars. I want to take also this opportunity to thank again the WHS team for helping us in doing those webinars. And now it's a pleasure to invite the other three panelists to the table for the second part of this session. Uh, please, uh, please come, the three of you uh, here so that we can introduce them one by one uh, later on. And the first uh, speaker will be uh, Professor um, Amir Hossein Takian. Uh, he has many uh, affiliations. So um, Amir, if you don't mind, I will limit to a couple of them. <laughs> you are head of uh, the Department of Global Health and Public Policy and Vice Dean of the School of Public Health at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. He's also a member of the Executive Committee of the MAT Alliance. So we worked a lot on, on these programs together. Thank you, Amir. And then uh, he will give a talk on addressing the political determinants of health in health and migration research. Please, Amir, you have the floor. Can I have my slides, please? Good afternoon, and thanks very much, Luciano. I mean, after what uh, has mentioned by His Excellency Professor, uh, His Excellency uh, Ivanich and other colleagues, uh, I have nothing new to say than somehow setting the scene to say that how political is migration health because health is a very political issue i'm trying to how it works oh yeah okay yeah Oops. okay health is a very political issue you need to be very gentle with this everyone okay it's very sensitive so okay so uh, what i'm trying to say is just wrapping off what it has been said migration Health is very political, and the political dimensions of that are too many. Very simply, when people migrate from one place to another, there are some pulling factors, there are some pushing factors. People go out of their own settings because of the conditions is deteriorating in the home settings, like wages, political unrest, uh, good health care, and this kind of things. And then they go to the destination because of better conditions or perceived better conditions in those countries. Like for instance, better education, better opportunities for employment, better healthcare, better opportunities for the children and the youngsters. That's why it is important for both policymakers at the hosting countries and at the origin countries to address these dimensions. And if they can address these dimensions, then they can do something in order to somehow reduce this kind of uh, migration and somehow affect that in good, good and better ways. In the Global Action Plan for the Health of Refugees and Migrants, there are so many points. One thing is we need to concentrate on the definition and typology of these people, displaced people, internal displaced people, migrants, refugees. These are different. And the ultimate goals of any health system, like for instance, universal health coverage, for instance, reaching out these populations and equal inclusion of those people is essential in order to ensure that these people have been addressed quite well. So that's why there are some frameworks, for instance, for that. The political determinants of migrations, pushing factors are economic and non-economic, and pulling factors are the same as well. So when we are talking about addressing the political determinants of migrations, we need to consider these factors, like for instance, poverty and low wages in the countries and better demand for labor and high wages in the hosting countries. I don't have time to go, you know, uh, better than me, for instance, for instance, taxes, for instance, poor healthcare, war or oppression, corruption, those contextual factors play a big role. That's why if we want to concentrate on the issues to address these, we need to bring into consideration these issues. It takes time to understand it, and then when I'm there, that my time is over. All right. And uh, it's different. <laughs> Be gentle. Okay. As, as Stephen mentioned, this framework, so you're familiar with that as well in the publication. I encourage you to read that. And this somehow 
uh, summarizes the different contributing factors, specifically during the COVID-19, which is very valid for that. But I want to concentrate on the last part of my, uh, my presentation, which is about how we are going to address that and the issues that we need to bring into the consideration. There are some priorities in order to address the political dimensions. And for the sake of time, I just go to some of them. There are eight of them, actually, and then uh, leave it to the rest of the panelists and your good self in order to discuss how we can address them. Generally, there is a lack of research funding opportunity. There is a lack of resources spent in many countries, and uh, during, I mean, the hosting countries and the sending country goals in order to understand the knowledge about uh, the different aspects of migration and the political dimension, specifically when we go to climate change, for instance. How I come from Iran. We are hosting about 5 million Afghan refugees. And those Afghan refugees have been more than doubled in the course of only last 12 months, Your Excellency. And the reason is, overnight, there was something in Afghanistan back in August 2021, and this affected the influx of Afghanistan, uh, Afghan people from Afghanistan to Iran. How are we going to address that? How are we going to collaborate with the hosting countries? What kind of knowledge we have in terms of that? This knowledge is very, very scarce. And within Iran, because 80% of my country is desert. So that's why internal displacement because of water tension is really, really massive. So how climate change is addressing that is, is very, very new. And then we need to train a new generation of, of, of researchers in order to address that. The second thing which I want to mention is uh, uh, the issue of translation of research into policy and practice. For instance, as I said, the difference between migrants refugees, displaced people, is not clear for the policymakers. If we are going to address the political dimensions, we need to somehow do more research on the typology of migrants and understand the effective mechanisms and the global governance for the refugees. And the most important issue is understanding how the governance of the health system in reaction and in collaboration with the public policy of the countries can somehow shape this picture for the migrants. We are lacking this kind of evidence in many contexts, including the high income countries. And specifically one thing which is needed is longitudinal research, longitudinal studies to understand how over the time the needs of the refugees is being built up is being changed. The next generation of refugees in 20 years to come and the 20 years back, how it is affecting their involvement in the societies. There is a global lack of comprehensive and high quality contextualized research, specifically implementation research, how intervention and good policies within the healthcare system can be nurtured. Particularly one thing which is important, and uh, it, in my view, uh, as it was mentioned by uh, his, his Excellency, is the issue of how within the healthcare system, there is no distinction between the refugees and migrants and the normal population. He mentioned some examples that some parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this is the case almost everywhere. These are human beings. And based on the convention of human rights, these refugees should have the right of living like the hosting citizens. How we are going to address that and how we are going to somehow harmonize the healthcare system that we are providing at the political level. For the sake of time, I will go more quickly. And specifically, I come from a middle-income country, the low and middle-income countries who receive many of them, and specifically internal displaced people from urban settings to the rural settings, and specifically in the context of universal health coverage when we have the lack of insurance, that's very important. One particular issue in Iran is out of 5 million refugees, gone refugees mostly, only less than a million are documented. So we are facing a situation that about 4 million refugees are illegal. They are undocumented and they need education, they need basic jobs, they need food, they need shelter and everything. Addressing those undocumented refugees is a very long standing issue almost everywhere, including specific in the low income settings. And let alone in some countries like mine, when there is no camp, refugees camp, there is no UNHCR official facility for them, that makes it a very, very important and, and, and different. Measuring the economic impact is another thing. You know, politicians, they understand numbers. There are too many things. How on earth we have enough numbers 
to convince politicians that if you spend some fund on this group of people, not just for the humanitarian issues, or for the economic issues as well, these are the part of the society, documented or undocumented anyway. What is the economic impact of inclusion of refugees, migrants, and displaced people within the communities? And then they, they need to do something to somehow demonstrate that. An economic cost of exclusion of migrants, we need two things. One, when we exclude migrants and refugees from the, within the healthcare system, what are the disbenefits of that in terms of number, economic loss? And when we include them, what are the economic benefits that we are taking from that? That's important. I'm finishing in one minute, Shana. How to integrate healthcare services is very important as well. The fourth one is improving political diplomacy. In terms of a specific, let me give you two examples. Among refugees, the most vulnerable are undocumented, women, pregnant women, children, specifically children. We need to address those. We don't have enough political willingness to address those. In some countries, they are denied for the right of education. And then they grow up in those societies and they sometimes become criminals. The second thing is stigmatization and the stigma around them and being branded by uh, the hosting population as criminals, undocumented people, dodgy people, and these kind of things. So this needs more, uh, more attention. And in that particular thing, we need to have more uh, integrative models how United Nations organizations like UNHCR, IOM, or uh, uh, WHO and others, UNICEF, they work together in a coherent manner to use the resources in order to address these challenges. We don't have enough data. And the, sec the, the, the sixth one is data and monitoring system. Data and monitoring system is very important. Give, I give you one example. If at all we provide some services for these refugees, migrants, and others, the majority of those services, there is no exception are at the point of care. So if there are some facilities, they go and use the facilities at the point of care, then we register them or we understand their needs, what their needs are. We don't have whatsoever any understanding from the pre-registration, from the pre-time that the pre-migration period for them, we need to address that and we need to somehow compare with others. And finally, social determinants of, I, 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 I go from this one, the supporting a participatory approach, because that's very important. We decide about them, social participation is crucial, and particularly we need to bring this group of people. They have language barriers, they have other barriers, they have data gaps for them. We need to decide about them with them. So no decision about me without me, which is the motto of the Voters Organization, should be about this group of people. And finally, social determinants of us, which was covered one particular thing from COVID-19 is now we are in a hybrid conference. COVID-19 showed us more deliberately telemedicine, telecare, teleworking, how it can help. So we need to use these facilities for migration and we don't have enough data to experience and document how we can address that. I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. For the time. Thank you, Amir, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Now we uh, move on to the next presentation. It's a pleasure to invite Kabir uh, Sheikh as a policy advisor of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research of the WHO. And they will talk about health system responses to migration, research gaps, and opportunities. Please. Try to stay for five, seven minutes per presentation, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I don't have slides. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm, uh, I work for the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. It's a partnership hosted by WHO. Uh, and we work specifically to promote um, evidence-informed uh, health systems strengthening efforts in low and middle-income countries. Uh, so I'm going to start by making a conf confession and admission on behalf of uh, the community of those of us that work on health systems and health system strengthening. And that is that migration, even though it's a phenomenon that has been so common, so part of the human condition throughout history, is a bit of a blind spot when it comes to how we conceptualize and envision health systems. And this needs to change. Uh, so what, what, what do I mean by that? So let's uh, backtrack a little bit to some of the conceptualization of health systems. One of the most defining issues for health system strengthening 
worldwide acknowledged by everybody is social exclusion, right? And that's very clear in all the presentations that have been made so far, what Steven said and on social determinants, what Amit said. Different people's access to health, social protection, and the conditions that contribute to good health is not uniform. And in many instances, these are available in very limited ways to some people. We know that. That's not something that's new. There's a Commission on Social Determinants and Health, I think more than 20 years ago, that, that outlined this in extreme detail. And this exclusion is not random. It's marked along very specific and very well-established axes of inequality. Gender, race, class, community, all the different social determinants. And migrant status is one of the most significant of these variables. And it's even more so because it often intersects with those other axes of uh, vulnerability. So an intersectionality perspective is absolutely crucial to understand uh, the issues of health systems and migration. Uh, so now this exclusion is often worsened by catastrophic events and phenomena like pandemics, disasters, fragility, and violent conflict. Take the pandemic uh, on, uh, for example. Uh, in uh, many countries, we found that economic migrants have had to abandon their livelihoods and return to their homes when faced with prolonged lockdowns. This is an example from my own country, from India. On the other hand, refugees and displaced people face the added burdens of associated health problems and unequal access to health systems. Uh, three years ago, I had the honor of being a member of the Lancet Commission on Migration and Health. Uh, that was 2018-19, that's about the time it came out. And I was tasked with leading the section on health systems. And in that report, we made a pretty bold, a pretty strong statement. We said that the current thinking on health systems could well have what we call a migration problem. And now I quote from the report, mainstream views of a health system tend to be of a jurisdiction defined by geopolitical boundaries within which services are provided rather than more appropriately and justly a societal response to people's needs regardless of their official status. I can say that again uh, if that's needed, but essentially what we are saying is that the jurisdiction-based thinking around health systems has constrained a more people-centered approach to uh, what health systems should be, uh, and, and that is particularly significant for migration. So migration is a defining issue for health system strengthening globally. In order to address this problem, it's important that the following steps should be taken. First, a conceptual shift. Our approach to health system strengthening should have an increased consideration of migration and human mobility. Equity problems are never resolved by just saying that we need to improve equity. We must be specifically focused on fighting inequities. An inclusionary approach to health systems development necessitates an explicit focus on acknowledging and tackling the specific causes of exclusion of which migration is one. We have to work to establish the conceptual foundation of people-centered health systems that are responsive to migrants' needs and to migration and mobility as a core part of the human experience. Second, and now I'm talking to more to the knowledge and research side of things, a shift in how we do research on topics such as migration and health systems. Uh, and again, here I'm going to draw a little bit on Santino's words that we need to focus a little bit on optimism when it comes to research on migration. Uh, health policy and systems research brings a transdisciplinary lens that focuses on health systems challenges and questions and how to address them to bring change. Multiple disciplines, including from the social sciences and public health are applied to contribute towards this change. So now what's different about this health policy and systems research lens is that it privileges the perspectives of those who are engaged in bringing about the changes. So it's not so much focused on the perspectives of researchers or research funders. It focuses more on who are the decision makers, who are the stakeholders in countries who want to bring about those changes and what are their learning needs? What are their evidence needs that need to be done? Uh, so HPSR, health policy and systems research involves those stakeholders. Uh, we involve them at every step of the research process and we make in by doing so we make research more relevant and we increase the likelihood that research will be used to inform change. For instance, there are several important interventions being rolled out now by enlightened policymakers. My previous colleagues in the previous panel referred to several of them. And many of these are focused on strengthening health systems responses to migration. So more and more, we need to understand what are the evidence needs of these decision makers and these policymakers. And these evidence needs are not going to be generic. They're going to be highly contextual. They're going to be context specific and based on the situation in which they are, they are operating. And we need to work closely with them in generating that evidence. 
So that's a difference, a shift in how we do research on, on a topic such as migration and health systems. And third and finally, we need to expand our lines of inquiry in the field of health policy and systems research to include critical questions that are fundamental to migration issues. Uh, so again, I'm going to come back a little bit to the Lancet Commission because we advanced at that point several formative as well as explanatory research questions that should be considered. I'm going to paraphrase here. First, and this is the most overarching issue, how can prevailing jurisdiction-based health systems governance be made more sensitive to the needs of migrants? Uh, within that, three priority questions, but of course there are a multitude of questions that they hold. What financing models are most effective in extending access equitably to migrants? I think Poonam alluded to that. That's a great uh, uh, takeoff from IOM's work on financial models. Second, how can healthcare providers be equipped with the necessary competencies for migrant care? Very often the real act barrier is at that level of, uh, of uh, competencies of healthcare providers. That's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, the interaction between the service provider and the, and the client. Uh, third, how can information systems be made more portable and interoperable while still preserving patient rights and privacy? So we've often seen major movements by governments to have, say, for example, uh, unique uh, identifiers or to digitize the health system and give people uh, social security numbers. Uh, but with that comes a whole plethora of problems around privacy and, and confidentiality and the use and commodification sometimes of those data. So that is a critical question that needs to be addressed. Uh, but finally, I will say that uh, equally important to these explanatory and descriptive type questions, what we really need is context specific implementation and intervention research which is linked to migration friendly health systems reforms that are taking place in many different parts of the world. We need to find those reforms, we need to find those interventions and we need to learn from them. These are the, this is the sort of research that can help health system decision makers identify bottlenecks and enablers and learn which approaches work better in which context. So on behalf of the Alliance, we are going to be working very closely with the global migration program, uh, Santino's here. Uh, and uh, we are going to be helping them uh, and supporting them to develop the research agenda further. It's not going to be easy because it requires very fundamental changes in mindsets and changes in the way that we do business, but we are fully committed to it and we look forward to working with them and to supporting this agenda. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so now last but not least, we have the presentation by Ri Musa from uh, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, she is a forced migration team lead and uh, she will uh, give a talk on drawing on evidence to inform action to protect the health of migrants, please. Thank you. Not as tall as that. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting us to speak together about this important topic today. Um, I already apologize because I think I will maybe not have the same sense of optimism um, as, as the people that have presented before me. And I will present a bit more about the operational research and clinical data that we see and observe as, as a result of our operations um, and humanitarian operations that MSF conducts globally. So as, as highlighted already by my esteemed colleagues, the issue of migration and health is increasingly a de defining issue for global public health, but also of humanitarian concern. I think all the examples that have been listed before me highlight that there's an urgency for all people working on health, from policymakers to clinicians to researchers, to better understand and respond to the needs and aspirations of migrants, as well as the social and political inequities that shape their health and well-being. As an international humanitarian organization, Doctors Without Borders is often confronted with the implications of mobility, but more so and increasingly of migration policies on people's health. Migration does not have an automatic or natural negative effect on people's health. And I think that's something we should be very <laughs> forward about. Migration is not uh, a determining factor of positive or negative health automatically. However, in the current context of increasingly restrictive migration policies, MSF teams working along migration routes and at borders across the world continuously, neg um, continuously document uh, a pattern of negative consequences on people's health as a direct result of policies. Along migration routes, people on the move face a cumulative effect of various traumatic events and migration-related vulnerabilities. 
that in, that includes but is not limited to exclusion from health, social protection and health systems to direct violence and several forms of exploitation. Most people treated by MSF or migration routes report experiencing one or more traumatic events during their migration journey. This includes experiencing torture and forms of, Ill, uh, forms of violence and ill treatment, differing forms of formal and informal incarceration deten and detention, shipwrecks and being stranded at sea, deserts and in forests without assistance, violent pushbacks and persecution due to their race, ethnicity, sexuality and gender. These forms of violence are not limited to non-state actors and gangs, but also to border guards and police. MSF studies in various regions, including in Europe and North Africa, Southern Africa, and Central and Northern America regions, find that between 60 to 80% of violence reported by patients to MSF were perpetrated by state authorities. This violence often occurs at sites of detention and at borders or during pushbacks, however, can also be found in urban settings and further away from borders. Due to a lack of protection and assistance along migration routes, migrants are often exposed to life-threatening risks. According to IOM, more than 25,000 migrants are considered dead or missing in the Central Mediterranean since 2014. MSF search and rescue operations in the Central Mediterranean and the search and rescue operations of other NGOs are continuously being criminalized and deterred by states. And Oftentimes, we, we provide critical medical assistance to those that are rescued who, who present with several um, um, conditions such as severe dehydration, exposure to burns, and other skin conditions. Wound care require urgent medical, psychological, and medical assistance. For migrants who are deported and pushed back to countries such as Libya, Niger, or Mexico, they are often trapped in cycles of exploitation and abuse. An MSF study in Mexico in 2019 found that out of 80 patients returned to Mexico from the USA, up to 70% were at risk or had experienced kidnappings after their deportation. In Niger, returned migrants are often left stranded at the border in the desert without assistance or protection. Another area of concern is the increasing use of detention and other forms of containment used by states as a deterrence or a migration management tool. Extensive research has been done on immigration detention. I don't think we need any more evidence about the negative health impact of immigration detention, including from a, a recent report from WHO Europe, which have all demonstrated the severe and long lasting impact of detention on the health of people, both during and after their release. However, this practice continues to be reinforced by states. MSF has worked in various forms of detention and containment settings for over 20 years and conducted several studies analyzing clinical data, which demonstrate the severity of the health impact. For example, in detention centers in Libya, men, women, and children are detained in overcrowded cells with little light and ventilation, which often lack access to health assistance, water, and food. MSF teams working in these settings often treat illnesses related to these dangerous conditions, and this includes new infections of TB, malnutrition amongst adults, and significantly high rates of violence-induced wounds and reports of sexual and physical abuse. Simil similarly, in containment settings, such as the EU-funded hotspots on the Greek islands, or in Australia's offshore, shore, offshore shoring centers on Nauru, um, MSF has documented the severe mental health deterioration amongst refugees and asylum seekers. Our operations in Nauru in 2019 found an unprecedented level of mental health suffering amongst our patients. Amongst 200 patients, 60% had suicidal thoughts and 30% had attempted suicide, including children. Almost two thirds were diagnosed with severe depression, followed by anxiety and PTSD, and a total of 12 adults and children were diagnosed with the rare condition resignation syndrome. Often stresses include long-term and indefinite containment on the island, family separation, lack of safety, and a lack of medical assistance. The mental health outcomes amongst that we saw in Nauru were amongst the worst treated in Nauru in, in, by treated by MSF globally. This includes in projects that were focused on the rehabilitation of torture victims. However, offshoring policies and various forms of de facto detention are currently being replicated by states. Restrictions on routes, increased situations of migrants fleeing are becoming more protracted and people are spending longer time stuck in this transit phase, not only at borders, but particularly in poor and precarious living conditions without legal assistance and limited access to health. 
I have to rush, so I'll be very quick. And I think we've all touched on the need for um, increasing access to health. But some of the barriers that we observe in terms of access to health are both in uh, are both administrative and in include in even and even when um, migrants have access to health, there is a lack of knowledge to their um, to their health entitlements. But barriers such as access to affordability of care and also uh, in terms of transport and access to care and the adaption of migrant sensitive systems, including cultural mediators and understanding of health seeking behaviors, include as well as experiences of discrimination and racism by health workforce and fear of deportation are all barriers in accessing care. So what does this mean for all of us in this room and all those that are working on health? Well, whilst there's a continued need for evidence and research in migration health, we also need to adapt our current responses to the current reality that migrants are faced with. And this includes advocating against policies that have a direct risk on a migrants' health and ensuring that the right, to health, the right to health is upheld within a framework of solidarity and humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another three excellent uh, thank you. The, the excellent presentation thank you very much santino would you like to uh, also comment uh, this uh, part in one minute please really in uh, in a tweet i think we have a, a strong uh, argument to really engage into a deep uh, reflection on how to uh, promote uh, broader and more consistent political commitment and uh, support political choice for uh, an inclusive health system approach, at least uh, for majority of the country. Um, this came up, was alluded in a number of uh, cases. Uh, the experience of COVID-19 is a pre precious experience. that We're supposed to build on the positive part uh, one third of uh, countries around the world have been using a universalistic approach, justified by the pressure of COVID. But this has been proving that no one went in bankrupt, and this is possible, is doable. Where we are not uh, active, where there is a, a caveat which we should supposed to feel as soon as possible, is to really document in detail the cost of action versus vis a vis the cost of not action. Uh, this to really diffuse um, narratives, negative narratives about. Data, data is an open burning issue, uh, bearing huge complexity. The issue of portability of data. Indeed, the digital health, digitalization is uh, offering tremendous opportunities. Uh, but I think we need to start from ground zero, really supporting countries to start to collect at least data against one indicator and disaggregating them. This is not the case for most of the country worldwide. And uh, the main issue is the uh, not scar necessarily the scarcity of data, but in many cases the redundancy of data. But those data are not good quality, not comparable, so very difficult to be utilized to really support uh, policy speculations or uh, health system uh, in uh, interventions. Uh, last but not least, I really uh, like, uh, actually the last two, uh, the um, allusion to the definitions, how those are still uh, massively hampering the access to health systems. Uh, I think we should start to really promote and engage countries to uh, to make a bit of clarity uh, on a definition where there is no consensus and still so much heavy in terms of influencing than the access to health system. Um, the situation with refugees is much easier, if I can say in brackets, because we have a convention defining who is refugee and when the convention is ratified at the country becoming law. With migration is really is a climb in the Everest because there is not even agreement on who are the migrants, who are the sub subgroup. But this is really vital. And again, learning from COVID, probably a public health approach should be able to uh, oversee those uh, um, definition slash legal differences. Last but not least, I think uh, Professor Amir uh, really uh, provided uh, the, the roadmap for the research agenda. Uh, we are really in necessity of quality research. Uh, 
We just released in July the first world report on the status of refugees and migrants. We analyzed 87,000 sources of evidence worldwide. Uh, we analyzed the situation in six regions. And this was a, a, a titanic uh, business, mostly because the evidence so fragmented, so contradictory, so anecdotal. So we really need to have a better quality research. Um, we need to have a, probably uh, more concrete actions in transferring the research into policy actions. This is really a priority for WHO. And last but not least, resources probably... Uh, yeah, one, but, one minute was... Uh, yeah, I'm, conclu I'm concluding. <laughs> resources probably is not... Uh, the, the lack of resources, I'm not totally concurring with Professor Amir, but probably what we need to do is... Uh, uh, better use of the resources when available in uh, uh, to engage into quality research and strategic research. Thank you for Thank you. accepting uh, my uh, long my long comment. <laughs> no, as, as Italian in Germany, I know that I need to be very careful about the time. But I mean, if I take three four minutes, I think they will uh, forgive me. So maybe we can take only two short questions and two short answers from the audience, please. So I have see some hands here. So we take please very short also for the answers. Please tell your name and affiliation. My name is Tamara Kishi and um, I am a global health researcher from the Netherlands. And my question is, uh, and I'm quoting from the statements that Mr. Santino has made about um, who is defining who is refugees, uh, the climate refugees, now with the climate happening and uh, disasters happening either in, in um, Africa on a slow um, scale or as having abrupt in Pakistan with the floating, um, to what to to how extent to what to how extent is um, including of those refugees or those migrant forces um, in in the policies? Is it possible or not? And what is the efforts that has been made so far for to include them specifically them as they are like kind of special uh, type of refugees or migrants? They didn't plan for that uh, crisis to happen for them. And thank you so much. Thank you. Who would like to react? Um, actually, it was for uh, all the speakers and all the panelists. I needed to answer from people. Maybe we start. Would you like to react to this very quickly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it has to be green. Okay. Um, no, I think it's a super complex question. So the the the. the, the climate refugee as you know is not a is not a real legal definition the the issue then and it kind of links to my speech is that oftentimes people that are displaced by climate change or likely livelihood issues are framed within the framework of economic migrants and then this reproduction of you know violence and exclusion that we that we're talking about is often they have to bear the brunt also people might not define themselves as climate refugees however there are examples that we do see particularly in the southeast asia and the pacific region which is i think interesting to look at if you're interested in the topic on the ways in which people are categorizing themselves as climate refugees and also the ways in which states are trying to respond to mass displacements linked to climate change. So I would recommend looking at that region if that's something. Thank you. Good. Maybe another one, but very please, very short. Also short the answer. We only can take another one. Sorry about this. Okay. And please also name affiliation or to whom you are addressing the question. Uh, hello, my name is Teresa Kruger. I'm a final year medical student from the German Medical Students Alliance. Um, I'm also a feminist, and uh, it's it's not a question. It's actually to say thank you to you, Rimusa, because you said at the beginning you don't have such an optimistic view, and I think actually that's um, yeah. Just thank you for sharing this catastrophic status quo in which we are, the stories of the people. And I think there are two things that I sometimes miss when we speak about migration and health. One is women and men are not equally affected when it comes to migration. And the second one, we sometimes forget about the factor of political freedom and of political persecution as a factor of migration. Jinjan Azadin, thank you. Thank you. I think this is a perfect conclusion. <laughs> so let me let me thank uh, again uh, all uh, our uh, excellent panelists, uh, also Professor Martin for making the transition between the two parts. I want to thank uh, very much again uh, Dr. Santino Severoni, the director of the Health and Migration Program of WHO, and uh, his excellent collaborators, uh, Miriam Markut, uh, Rita Samachado. I want also to thank very much the WHS, uh, Julian Kickbush, uh, Louisa Jordan, and many other people who made possible this session. And also, let me say special thanks to the technical team here in the room who helped us so much. Thank you very much to all of you the participants in the room and online.